Hey there, folks. Chuck here. Before we get started, a quick note. Uh, this episode was recorded over Zoom instead of our usual uh, app that we use for recording, so the quality of the video is a little funky, but bear with it and stick around because it's really worth it. Charlie gives us an amazing walking tour of his Matchbox collection. It's unlike anything I've ever seen in diecast collecting, and it's definitely worth sticking around for. And uh, while you're at it, make sure you're liking, subscribing, and sharing these videos, because we've got some really cool stuff coming up, including Mike Hutchinson of Gaslands, coming up in the next few episodes. So that's an amazing conversation. You'll want to stick around for that. But uh, yeah, anyway, we're going to get to the episode, and I uh, hope you really enjoy it. Thanks again for sticking with us through all this as we continue to push for 10,000 subscribers and to get 24,000 cars for kids in need for Driven Dreams. So, all right, without any further ado, here's the show. You're watching Diecast Breakdown with Chuck Ellis, David Johns, and Mark McHotwheel. So sit back, strap in, and hang on. The breakdown starts. Hey there, folks. Chuck here, and welcome to another episode of Diecast Breakdown. I am so glad you're with us today. We got a great show lined up. We are talking to Charlie Mack, who is an expert, probably the expert, when it comes to Diecast Matchbox uh, vehicles. And we're going to be learning a lot from him today. But before I do that, I want to thank our executive producer, the local patrons. That would be Mr. Twice Diecast, Driven Dreams Org. First and 64th Customs, Video Geek Production, and of course, our honorary executive producer, Mr. Day himself. Thank you all so much to them and to the other patrons that support the show. We are so grateful to them for keeping the lights on. If you want to join their ranks, you can click the little join button down below on the YouTube video or visit diecastbreakdown.com, and that'll take you to our Patreon link and to our merch and socials and all that other stuff, so you can stay in touch with us and follow along. But... We're not here to talk about that today. We are here to talk Matchbox. And before I do that, I must introduce my co-host, Mr. David Johns. David, how are you doing today? Doing good, Chuck. And uh, I hate to break it to a lot of the viewers, but uh, secretly, I've always preferred Matchbox over Hot Wheels. Uh-oh. Hot take. Hey, now. <laughs> All right. Well, we have got the uh, the man who can win just about anybody over to Matchbox, and we're going to be talking a lot about that today. So, uh, Charlie Mack, thank you so much for being on the show. I am so thrilled to have you on today. Oh, thank you. So, for uh, those like three people that are watching this that don't know, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your collection. Well, I'm just turned sixty eight recently. I've been collecting Matchbox. Since at least six years old, became a true collector at the age of 10. So I've been doing this for quite a bit of time. Uh, I started as a child and it became my uh, toy of choice. Mm. There was no uh, Hot Wheels around, so I had to go with the Matchbox. And, and they never turned back. Yeah, that's true, because uh, if you're 68, that would have been before Hot Wheels really became a thing, which would have been about a decade later, right? Correct. Yeah, Correct. so, yeah, it's funny. We, we've had people on the show that are the real big diecast heads, and those are the people that were born around 1960 and had that, like, came of age, like, where they were born in 62, 63, so they were, like, eight years old or nine years old when Hot Wheels came out and, you know, all the... The folks that we talked to, they're a little older than that. They're all uh, big Matchbox uh, fans. And uh, I I'm very curious, at the time, what was it like to discover Matchbox? Because there really wasn't anything else quite like that on the market, was there? No, not at all. It, it just became a, a thing where I just liked as a little kid playing with little toy cars. And it was the only thing there was. I never got, as I got a little bit older, <clears throat> excuse me. Never got interested in video games. I tried that for about five minutes. That was the end of that. Mm -hmm. And most of the other t board games come and go. But I always ended up coming right back to the uh, Matchbox toys. Mm -hmm. Back when uh, me and my, bro my brothers was a little younger. And we'd set up uh, a little city 
on our patio and just spent hours building a the little, little towns and mm-hmm. uh, roughing up the cars a little bit at that age. And then <laughs> later uh, became a collector. Yeah. Do you still have any of those original cars in your collection? None of the original stuff is left. Oh, I wow. do remember having all my cars fit inside of a green silverware tray. Mm-mm. So it was probably like 40, 50 cars back in like the mid sixties mm-hmm. and it blossomed into 11 rooms in the entire house. Wow. Yeah. I, uh, I have, I still have a few of my original cars from growing up because I had a little brother and they went to him. And then by the time he was done with them, I got back interested in them again. So they ended up coming back to me. So it worked out. Uh, rather well that I let them go and I was somehow able to get a lot of my original toy cars as a kid back. But uh, uh, that's really cool. And so, so you keep doing this, but you, you kind of kept the collection going. When, at what point did you realize I've got something really interesting here? I need to start documenting this. Well, I always kept track of what I had in my collection in a ledger. Mm-hmm. And by the time Q- computers come around, it was too uh, much to uh, change the computer. So it's still in a ledger. It's all handwritten oh, wow. notes. I think it's 15 booklets. And that's how I keep track of my collection. I've written all the books on it, and yet I've still never cataloged my own collection with my own books. Wow. So figure that, figure that one out. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's the, uh, what is it? The cobbler's son has no shoes, as they say. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, I, I get it. It's uh, it's a lot easier to do the work for other people and then get uh, behind on your own projects. That's really cool. So when did the first book come out? When did you write your first book? My first book would have been done in the probably the late 80s. Uh, Shipper Publishing came to me and another collector who since has passed away, Pat Lamagna, and they did the, the first Schiffer book based on my collection and his collection. And then that was done for over the course of years. And then they decided, well, how about you guys do the book? So I said, okay, I'll do the book. So I put together a small book. And when we did it, it was in the same small format. I think it was like nine by five. Mm -hmm. And I decided to break it up into like, historical years so the first book would have been 1947 to 69 which was all lesney regular wheel era mm-hmm. and then did the next one to 82 which was super fast era and then did another one when universal toys took over that went to 92 and then Tycho took over at the time and did like a two-year book of Tycho. so it was mm-hmm. like a four volume set at the time And then as time progressed, we decided, well, instead of doing these little books, let's combine it all back into one big book and came out with the encyclopedia. I gotcha. And that covered everything from 47 up to 2001. Mm. And then I did some other breakdown books. I did uh, a regular wheel book. It was more of a starter's guide on just regular wheels. Mm -hmm. And then I did what was called the big book of super fast. It was so big, it needed two books. So volume one was mostly the written stuff with some pictures. And the second volume was all pictures. And that one covered everything to 2004. And that was actually the last time I did a book. So it's been 20 years since I've written a book. And somebody says, well, when's the next book coming? I says, keep waiting. I said, I don't have time to pull everything down that's 20 years in the making and even being retired, take the time to write another book because it would take probably several years to compile something else. We had Mike Zarnock on here. He's basically you, but for Hot Wheels. Correct. And uh, yeah, he, uh, I don't know if you've ever interacted with him, but he's a, he's a character. Uh, We enjoyed talking to him a lot. And yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. A lot of people don't realize just how much work goes into it, but a lot uh, of typing, a lot of typing, <laughs> a lot of, lot of 
research and like he was saying when he wrote it, like he was writing stuff that literally had not been documented before. Like he had to track down individual people and ask, get information because it's not stuff that would be publicly available. A lot of it's relying on oral history almost. Was that kind of your experience writing this book? Doing my book since I was in it so long Mm -hmm. and had at the time almost everything that was cataloged. I didn't really have to reference a lot, but I did have a couple do proofreads mm-hmm. just to make sure I didn't miss something important. When I think about a lifetime of collecting one thing, uh, I, I don't think many people can actually truly relate to that. Uh, you know, a lot of times people drift from one fad to the next. You've been Matchbox to your core from day one. Mm-hmm. Give give some of our collectors who are newer in their hobby an idea of the scope of a collection that uh, that is built over a lifetime. It, and I know that you have had larger quantities of cars in your collection. So tell us, like, maybe the peak. How many Matchbox did you have at your highest and, and maybe where the collection's at right now? Well, I did have to sell the regular wheels back about 25 years ago, which broke my heart. But if, if you can see behind me, that's the, uh, the regular wheels. It's back up to about 800 pieces of which I originally only had 900. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I got more when bringing it back to what it used to be. I went. And got more into the minor variations where I had like crimped axles, rounded axles, little casting variations, treads on the tires and built it back up. And I'm still missing a lot of the really rare ones out of that. But the collection is probably hovering around 45,000 pieces. Mm. But people that go, uh, that have seen the, the, uh, Matchbox Man video or have come to visit the house, Notice that it's not just little matchbox cars. It can be games and dolls and play sets, uh, gas stations, uh, prototypes, anything that's matchbox branded at the time or mm-hmm. Lesney mm-hmm. at the time. So yeah, it, can, gotcha. it can be overwhelming for somebody that wants to start collecting. They'll say, what should I collect? Mm-hmm. And I say, Number one, collect what you like, collect what you can afford. If I know people that are even uh, been collecting for years, they're not completists. They don't have to have everything. They collect, say, just the real cars or say one particular line, like just the mm-hmm. ST year or just the super fast, just the regular wheels, or they'll collect historically. I just want the Lesney stuff up to 82. Or maybe I just want the Lesney stuff up to before it became super fast. Or you got a lot of collectors now that actually start with the Mattel era, which seems to be a lot of the people that go to the Albuquerque convention. It's like everything exists from 1996 forward, Mm -hmm. but they don't know a lot of the historical of going backwards. We'll be back with more DieCast Breakdown after this word from our sponsors. Legendary Hollywood concept artist and designer Fireball Tim Lawrence has created three exclusive pieces of automotive art based on the three hosts of DieCast Breakdown. Get these and other brilliant designs printed on mugs and more at FireballTimGarage.art today. Diecast Breakdown would like to thank Diecast Heroes Magazine for supporting this program. Diecast Heroes Magazine is the premier digital and print resource just for Diecast customizers. Visit DiecastHeroes.com and see what the best customizers in the world are up to. Here's this week's small channel shout out. Diecast Dankamas. If you have a favorite diecast channel with less than 700 subscribers and you'd like to see them highlighted on a future episode, email us at diecastbreakdown at gmail.com. And now back to Diecast Breakdown. For somebody who is new to collecting and maybe doesn't know all the different eras, could you do a quick breakdown of the different eras of Matchbox and what 
sets each one of those generations apart? Well, you have the original Lesney Corporation mm-hmm. started in 47, although the first Matchbox didn't start till 53. So most collectors are going to start in 1953, and then they'll start or stop in 16, 1969, which finishes when regular wheels were done, which nobody really remembers how that name came apart because Matchbox never called them regular wheels. It mm-hmm. came up from some historical thing. It would be interesting to find out who actually came up with that. Then you have 1969. When Matchbox had to compete with Hot Wheels and Mattel, the super mm. fast era started. Super fast went through to another category in 1982, which was when Lesney went bankrupt. So that's another start stop point for people. 82 now starts the new era of Matchbox International, which is owned by uh, Universal Toys. They owned it until 1992. So that's another era. 1992, Tyco Toys decided to make a bid to buy Matchbox out. Tyco got the bid. So now we got a Tyco era. That was short-lived to 1997, actually. Mattel took a bid and bought Tyco out, and with it came Matchbox. And now we got the Mattel era, which is now current right through to okay. as of today. So we're coming up on 30 years of uh, Mattel Which owning. is interesting because Mattel now owns it longer than <laughs> any of the other yeah. companies. That's true. That's interesting. Almost combined. Yeah. So in each of those are collector eras. Some people start and stop in each era. Some people will go through the whole Lesney era. Some people may just say, I'm going to start with Mattel. Yeah. It all depends on Sometimes it's an age thing. Yeah, I, I think you collect the stuff that you grow up with. Like I grew up with the Blackwall era Hot Wheels cars. So those were really the cars that I resonate with and I still collect. And I, I grew up with the, the the tail end kind of the super fast stuff was still around because I was born in 81. And, and uh, so I've just barely kind of fit in there, but they were, they were still sort of like, you'd get used toys or I'd play with big kids toys that were still yeah. had the super fasts, you know, you get the hand me down toys, but, uh, but yeah, I was definitely of that, uh, matchbox international era and, um, really enjoyed, um, uh, the, the, the toys of that era. I had the, I had the Halley's Comet. Uh, cars, the, the uh, Firebird, and I think it was a, was it a Mercury police car or a police car and the Chevy Pro Stacker? Yes, yes. So I had those. The Sand Digger was my favorite uh, as a kid. The green uh, VW Volkswagen. Beetle. Yes. The uh, Big Blue, uh, the other Volkswagen, yep. the funny car. The funny car. Yeah, those were the, those were two of my favorites growing up. So I get that. And, and I know some people, uh, have very strong opinions about the super fasts and because they were, uh, there was like a, wasn't there like a big rift within Matchbox when the super fast era started? Yes. A lot of the rift was even with Jack O'Dell, mm-hmm. the, one of the owners of Matchbox. He fought tooth and nail. I don't want super fast. I, the regular wheels were, were not yep. there. They're collectibles. They're not mm. supposed to be toys. And he finally gave in in 73 and he left the company. Mm -hmm. As soon as they got into his king size, he said that was the deal breaker. They Mm -hmm. started putting the super fast on his king size and he took a hike. Wow. That's a really interesting stance to have, especially considering it wasn't the whole point of Matchbox that the kids could have toys as long as they fit inside of a Matchbox. Yes. So, yeah, well, so they he, were literally yeah, designed to be his, toys. Yeah, but he did do his classic stuff with the S tier. True, but they, true. But he did make a box to put the stuff in, so it was a large batch box. Yeah, and exactly. So, Charlie, I, I can I can kind of understand the the hesitation in him going down that road because when you when when a lot of people who don't know some of the very first offerings by Leslie. Talk about some of the 
the types of die cast vehicles, equipment, and even the the horse drawn carriage, some of these collectors nowadays may not even be aware that those those very early offerings by Lesney were uh, supposed to be recreations of actual items and equipment more than a really cool car. Right. Well, when Leslie started in 1947, they called themselves Leslie Products because they weren't sure what they were going to make. Mm-hmm. They, started, they started off as just making things for other people. I, I got to ask Leslie Smith many years ago, what's the first thing Leslie Products ever made? And he told me windshield wipers for a company in Venezuela. So hmm. okay. try to find one, one of those. You'll never, never <laughs> find them. But then, um, they decided that during the slow Christmas time, they, de- they decided to get a little bit into the toy business and uh, started developing like one toy at Christmas time. And when they were larger scale. And then by 53, they decided to uh, start doing these uh, little matchbox cars. And the story is on the History Channel, and it's been through history. How uh, His daughter said, Dad, I need something to put in a little small matchbox to bring to school. They won't let us bring anything bigger for show and tell. And he said, oh, sounds like a good idea for a toy, a matchbox. And he built her a little brass prototype road roller. And that's all it took. And matchbox is off to the races. Who, who would have guessed the start of <laughs> probably the second most recognizable diecast car brand in the world was a road roller. Exactly. In fact, it took the first three models were the road roller, a little dump truck, and a cement mixer. They issued them at Christmas time in 53. They didn't, mm-hmm. the uh, trade actually called them Cracker Jack toys. They didn't think they were worthwhile for the kids. They thought they were kind of junky. Mm-hmm. And then they just said, oh, let's just keep going. And then they did the tractor and then they hit the bus, double decker bus. And everybody in England at the time where Matchbox were made knew what a double decker bus was. And they found their, their niche and it took a while, but most of the stuff would start off construction or commercial vehicles. And I believe it was number 22, no, 19. The MG was the first car and the 22, uh, Vauxhall Cresta were uh-huh. the first two cars in the line. Gotcha. Now, Matchbox is famous for the number 75. Could you tell us a bit about that and why? The number 75 is so significant for Matchbox? They, they uh, always, not, unlike Hot Wheels, they always numbered their stuff. And so everything would be numbered one to whatever. And in 1960, they got up to 75. And they said, hmm, that's a good round number to stop at. And let's take, say, the number one. This one's been around a little while. Let's do a new number one. Let's do a new number seven. And they started either resizing some of their pieces, but we did find out they were considering going over 75 because they did find a handful of models that were pre-pros that were numbered up to about number 80. So they were thinking about it, but there was a marketing decision back in 1960. 75 was cool. And it stayed mm-hmm. that way for almost ever until, probably, I think it was the 1990s, they decided, oh, let's go 100. And then it went back to 75. Then it went to 125. Then it went back to 100, which is where it is right now. But they were always called Matchbox 75 for most of the, most of the time in the old days. Charlie, I know... <laughs> Everybody has enjoyed the education, but I'm going to admit, and I'll be the first to raise my hand, that some of us were actually peeking over your shoulder while you were talking. Mm -hmm. Just just wondering about some of the jewels that are in there. Can you 
is there any, and maybe we can just get up and walk around in a little bit, but what are some of the earliest examples of castings that you have in your collection that, that true Matchbox fans will really appreciate? I do you have in my collection at least one of every die cast piece that Matchbox Toys has made since 1947, except for one, which is the Soapbox Racer, of which there's probably less than 15 documented pieces. And if I had four or $5,000 laying around, I could get one. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, I don't have that kind of cash laying around. But and I'm going to turn the camera around and show you where Matchbox started as Matchbox. The stuff from 1916 up through 1969, starting in 53. This is what are called regular wheels. This is all pretty super fast. They started off with metal wheels, changed to silver wheels, gray wheels, and finally black plastic wheels. Mm. And I've got mine all set in numerical order. So that's one through 35. Then we're going to split up this way. And this is 36 through 75. Wow. Now, Charlie, I'm noticing uh, there's a white VW Beetle in that uh, collection. I've uh, I've got one of those. Now, I have seen before on eBay somebody that was selling one like that that was made up to look like Herbie the Love Bug, and they claimed that that was actually done by Matchbox. Did Matchbox ever do that? I have not seen any true records on that piece. There's been historical notations that it's called what's called a Code 3, which is a private issue where okay. somebody made it because they would have to have license from Disney. Right. That's a Herbie the Love Bug. Mm-hmm. And I even sold one from somebody's collection for, I think it was four or $500. Yeah. Because it was yeah, a Herbie the Love Bug. But as far as I'm concerned, I do not have, do not have one in my collection because as far as I'm concerned, I'm not paying $500 for right. a private issue model. Right. Because it has been done as a regular wheel and it has been seen as a super fast. Okay. So, and but they were, but they were made by Matchbox. The model is a Matchbox. I don't oh, think okay. Matchbox or, or Lesney put those decals on there. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Cause I've seen the same thing and I was just like, well, I am not paying. I think mm, the one I saw was 350. <laughs> And, and, uh, I was like, but I don't even think that's real. Cause the, the box looked like the regular box there. Like it looked just like that one. And I actually have well, one of those. Anybody that wants to own one real cheap, you can probably yeah. go on eBay, buy mm-hmm. one of these, remove the labels and find a set and, of decals yeah. on eBay and make your own. Well, exactly. I mean, I, I could do that, but I was just, I was just curious. Cause I was like, why are these so expensive? Are they Customs are they something that Matchbox actually did? So thank you. Yeah, I guess they we can say no, they did not. They're customs. Started it's a custom. That's wild. Okay, yeah, awesome. And, okay, and one thing Charlie I learned in your documentary is, boy, they have really used a lot of uh, Matchbox in marketing campaigns, haven't they? Companies have. What what, what is the one that has been, uh, hundreds of different marketing, uh campaigns done on it you're talking um, more on new stuff yeah it was like a, a one of the vans so it's the maybe? model the or the model t uh panel i think that's it that everybody yeah. yeah like i know kellogg's did one and just about everybody did you like, i've got a rice krispies here. here i walk in this room okay yeah we might Good. be getting ahead right. of ourselves so <laughs> yeah and i'm gonna face it this way all right. Oh, well, wow. there they are. Yep, that's yeah. the one. This you, particular you grouping of Model A vans were produced by a company called ColorCom. Just retired on us back in September of 2023. 
And these are all very short run models. They can be as few as four or five wow. up to like several hundred. Mm-hmm. There are, if you count the color comp, there's a company also called ASAP that did a few, which was made more for trade shows and stuff where these are more collector mm-hmm. uh, printed. And you count ones that are called code one, which is made from the factory. And the thing was so popular over the years, they had to make a couple different uh, body tools. I think there's seven or eight different base plate castings. There's three different license plate castings. Plus you got the different windows, colors, and designs. And I have recorded over 800 different ones of these, if you count all those things into consideration. Wow, that is incredible. Yeah, I mean, I I remember growing up in the 80s and 90s, those were everywhere. Like you could find in a thrift shop or whatever, very weirdly, you were saying like trade shows or small businesses. Uh, I've got a... Uh, a version of the Holden panel van as that's got like a funeral homes uh, logo on the side of it. That <laughs> so they had a, like a, a run of them done for this particular funeral home. I thought it was very funny. So that would be one of the the uh, color cut models. Gotcha. Okay, it makes sense because the Model A panel van has that nice big side on it for doing doing logos. But it, it's also like the wasn't the Double decker bus and the the TV truck were also very popular. Short run or or branded collectible yes. pieces. Mm-hmm. So look at that. This looks yeah. This looks like some good stuff right here. This is yeah. a lot of the stuff that was predates Matchbox, like wow. the Cornish and Coach, mm-hmm. like Bone Cart. This is the one. Can you see a soapbox racer? Yeah, mm-hmm. there it is. That's yeah. the one I do not have a real one of. That's a copy. Mm-hmm. Is there a reason why they only made 15 of them? No, there. there's 15 surviving examples. Okay. We were so, told that there was 10 gross. 1,440 were made, and it did not sell well. They were uh, sold without a box. That's a, a copy that somebody imagined what it would like, look like if they made one. And I found out, we found out that whatever was not sold, the stores all sent them back to Leslie and they threw them in a melting pot. Oh, wow. Hmm. They didn't think of collectability back then. Sure. Back then they were just toys. It's kind of a hodgepodge of all kind of early stuff. And then there's a little hodgepodge of some other usual things stuck in there. Now, I saw in the documentary, you've got like prototypes and, and and stuff as well, too, right? Yes. Let me show you some prototypes. Hold on. Hold hold on that. I got to move something out of the way. No worries. A cat <laughs> twice. <laughs> okay. Nothing like a good old walk and talk. Yeah. Okay. These are some prototypes. These are, you can see my hand. Yep. Mm-hmm. How big they are to my hand. These are what are called pattern models, which they do not need to do anymore since there's 3D printing. But right. years ago, they would make a pattern model out of resin. And then they would take this model, lay it on a machine with a pantograph, and somebody would sit there tracing these things. And then mm-hmm. the machine on the other end would be carving out a a standard size matchbox model. As you can see, there's all different things that could be made. They did a weird thing during Tycho called car- carnivores. Mm-hmm. And they were they did a lot of weird things during Tycho. Thing. And they made two versions of it. And I found out these are the only two surviving examples of it. Oh, wow. I got that a couple years ago from one of the guys that got it from a tech employee. Yeah. All this kind of stuff is all prototype material. These prototypes are what the, the elite level collectors go after. Isn't that right? Some of them are. There's things, let me bring you in here. 
You've got things called pre-productions and color trials. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh my, look at this room, guys. Oh, wow. These are all color trials. Mm -hmm. These are, a lot of them are, are idea models that they were thinking of doing the deco and didn't do them. So these were Some never these, made? Uh, they were never made in the particular color or mm -hmm. the uh, deco. The cast, most of them, the castings were made. Right. Right. And then there's stuff like, these are those resins. Oh, wow. This is yeah. what would be toned down from those big pattern models. Mm -hmm. So those were samples that weren't finished. And then somebody would take and paint them. Mm -hmm. So they'd be painted. Charlie, this is amazing. Yeah. Oh, I had that champion uh, version of the Model A. That's cool. That one's made <laughs> out of resin. That's oh, actually well. a model that would, a few of those that are Leslie ones are ones that were actually at Toy Fair. They would only oh, make cool. like 12, 12 samples. Mm -hmm. So those would be the ones that they would show off what's coming, even though it hadn't been made yet. Right. Yeah. right. And these here are one of the kinds. These are things they thought of making. And surprisingly, they survived. Is that a GT90? Yes. In Matchbox. They were thinking of making that in the Tyco era. Uh -huh. And it was... Uh, you guys got too many new models. We got to cut one. I guess uh, that one's going. Oh, oh they did what? <laughs> how, how close we were to getting a Matchbox GT90. Right. Oh, the well, Black Beauty. Like, like the Bugatti they were going to do. And yeah. they told Bugatti to take a hike. They said, we're not giving you 40% royalty for your model. So we're not doing your Bugatti. <laughs> Is that a EB110? It yeah. might be. Yeah, it's an EB1. Because tank. it's made out of resin, it's not marked officially yeah. with all the tooling. I, I recognize the the Green Hornet's Black Beauty next to it, though. <laughs> they were good. They actually paid one of the Corgi dealers to get a, the uh, big Corgi to tool mm -hmm. down to make that. And then after they had this prototype done, they never got past that resin. Mm -hmm. And they said, after we make this, we can't do anything else with it. Right. Scrap it. Huh. And then uh Johnny Lightning took it. Yeah. Oh, so is that is that the actual one that Johnny Lightning used as a base or did they make their own? They had to make their own. Okay, gotcha. So I'm not sure what's with what they tooled it from. Yeah. What's what the box one was tooled from a corgi pattern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's with the one with the black and white eight wheels? That is, that was called a board designer one day, <laughs> decided to take the mini coop, chop it in half, <laughs> yeah. put a little guy, a girl, little guy and a girl in the car, mm -hmm. gave the girl side pink wheels, the guy side black wheels, and waste not, want not, put the other piece <laughs> together and make a trip. Look at that. Oh, that's and that's fun. probably where the push and puller idea uh, came that's what from. I was, yeah, was going to say that years ago. Yeah, it made me think of the push and puller. Oh, and that's, that's probably cool. where they got that idea. They probably saw it in my encyclopedia, this model. Huh. So this is like looking into the vault. This is exactly. uh, this is such a treat, just Charlie. To, just to give you an idea, we'll just take a, a pan here. Oh, wow. This whole wall. Or made in Bulgaria. Oh my gosh. They opened a factory in the uh, late eighties. So all the, this, that whole wall all the mm -hmm. way down. I can get how many. Are That's there. really interesting. And they were given carte blanche to paint them whatever color. And then Mattel started having fits in the mid two thousands <laughs> when they started, uh, they didn't know what certain words were. So you'd have a car that's an ambulance on a convertible, but got Coca Cola and oh, wow. Gal and Metallus screaming at him. 
you guys, we don't have licenses. <laughs> Stop, please. Yeah. And they finally shut them down in the mid 2000s. That's wild. Look at all these. That whole wall Amazing. is all color comps. Oh, wow. These are all those short run promos where you supply the models to him or he had some blanks. Mm -hmm. Charlie, while we're looking in, just to clarify, in case someone is watching this video in the future, are we mm -hmm. in the actual museum right now? This is the museum. You're in my home. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if people stumble across the museum and we'll we'll give the name the official name out and the uh area that it's in later but mm -hmm. uh this is what they can expect because good grief look at those holding utes right there yeah you got some fans in australia that are hitting their their jaws are hitting the floor right now <laughs> well some of them are real short runs like these two yeah. there's mm -hmm. a a guy out in Illinois, his son, his name is Holden. So he would do special models. And those were for his son's um, high school or something team. So he only made like 10 or 12 of them. He even made oh, one cool. happy birthday, Holden. Uh -huh. And ho, 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 Holden. <laughs> <laughs> Very fun. So for, for the people who are, are watching this, uh, you have this museum. It is kind of sort of open to the public. So what do people do if they want to want to see this collection? It's all by appointment. Mm -hmm. You supply the phone number at some point in our chat. All you mm -hmm. have to do is call me. And if I'm home, have a, have a museum visit. Very nice. This is kind of a hodgepodge kind of case. Got a little bit of everything in it. Smaller category stuff. Yeah. Anybody who wants to see the museum, expect, and if you want to take your time to look at it, two to, two to three hours in your day to wow. really get a good. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I could see myself a spending day. a whole day in there. That, that is so cool. Don't touch the dial. Diecast Breakdown will be right back after these messages. Diecast Breakdown is produced in partnership with Twice Diecast and Driven Dreams Org on YouTube. Check out their channels in the video description and subscribe for more epic Diecast content. Hey, this is Larry Wood. Hey, this is Derek from Honest Diecast. Hey, this is Chad Reed from Round 2. This is Mike from Gas Labs. The SRT Joe Vita Show. This is Champion DJ K. Hey, this is Mad Vision here. This is Diecast Dude. And you're watching Diecast Breakdown. And now, the thrilling conclusion of this week's episode of Diecast Breakdown. Now, are you going to be at uh, the Matchbox Con that's coming up here in a few weeks? That one I'm not going to be going to. It's a little bit of a haul. I will be at Hershey okay. at the uh, end of April. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I'll be at another Hershey at the end of September in York in November. Now, when you when you say you'll be there, are you going to have a booth where people can come I, up? I will and meet have you? a booth there to sell stuff. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. I, I love the fact that you have anything with a Matchbox logo on it. It might be in the museum. Oh yeah, this is this is where I wake up. <laughs> it's your happy place. Yep, this is where it started. It started in this room. This was my bedroom. Oh, wow. This is a prototype set. This is Mr. Men, Little Miss over in England. That's like mm -hmm. their Sesame Street over there. Yeah, I had some of those uh, toys, not the those specific toys, but I had like the books and there were some stickers and stuff. Uh, What's like interesting Mr. with this, as you can see, a lot of them were not finished. And it occurred right when Leslie was going bankrupt and they must have been like in the middle, in the middle of the project and decided that, uh, we're, guys were, were bankrupt. Stop. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hold on. I'm going to lose lighting here and I'm going to take you in the base. While you're talking and we're walking, Charlie, can I put you on the spot 
and I know they're all your kids and you love all of them, but what's your least favorite Matchbox casting? Least favorite? Least. I can point you at a whole full display. <laughs> and that's what I mean. I knew you'd still have them. But there has to be some that you just... Uh, He's here. Yeah, I think a lot of people can yeah. relate These to that. These were called the Ultra Heroes. They were numbered 1 through 30 in 2004. Mattel told the Mount Laurel Division to do these, and it almost killed the company. They were lucky. They were lucky that uh, they had their super fast recreations in 2004 mm -hmm. because when Walmart got those, Walmart says, guess what? We're not selling Matchbox anymore. Oh, wow. Oh. Yeah, and that could have been Mattel, a death blow. And uh, Walmart took them out of their store. Wow. All right. All right. We're heading for the lower level. Oh, boy. All right. The VIP area. Going down the stairs. Oh, wow. Charlie, is there a singular car? That you just think this is absolutely diecast perfection. Uh, probably. I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Chuck, what's your favorite matchbox? Well, that is a very good question. I really like uh there was a super fast uh Ford Mustang bread van. Uh, they did a smooth hood and then there was a like blown engine one. It was orange, like a burnt orange and it had kind of like a red and orange stripe on it. Uh, it's like a 71 Mustang or 70, 71 to 73 Mustang. The Wildcat Dragster. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that one. Uh, as a kid, Big Blue was my, my favorite because it opened up and it had the little red plastic hoop in it and mine had snapped. On Here's one side, but it still worked. Uh, I do really like that that Super Kings. Uh, is it the K seven or something? The cargo hauler, the one with the orange clear plastic uh, back on it that has the ramp. I'm spacing on the specific name of it. That one's really cool too. Uh, Jim Silva does a lot of really cool customs with that one. I've got one that I want to do a custom with. But it's what if not we? best shape <laughs> charlie would you mind just maybe putting your foot on the the brake just a little bit so the camera okay. can catch up because man we're am i going too fast for you just a little bit because we are seeing some some goodies here okay so how are these uh why are these in these rooms where they're at what's the uh grouping that they're in is this by era not necessarily like this is more prototypes here. Okay. When I just went in, I had I started the five packs on the wall, and then uh, ran out of yesteryear space upstairs, so it came down here. Um, when I do my uh, collection, all the miniatures are in their own category. You can see I've labeled. All the different areas. Uh, yeah. Uh, so okay. it says commandos, Coca Cola singles. Yep. Because in a mess or in pictures together, I'm never be able to get them all in one spot. Gotcha. Understood. These are models made in Hungary. They found out there was never a factory. We had a Hungarian couple went over there years and years ago. And they said, we're going to find it. And they found a row of houses, and each place was making matchbox Are in their basement me? and spraying them whatever color they felt like spraying them. Oh, wow. <laughs> and at the end of the row of houses was the, was the warehouse. And I guess they caught them as they were going and finishing up and 
bought everything that was left out. Wow. And some of these go big bucks. Mm-hmm. Like being the Rolls Royce, the BMW, especially to specific collectors that collect Volkswagens and Rolls Royces and uh, BMWs because they'll go over a hundred bucks a piece now. Wow. These are things called errors. I've got them several different locations. If you can see how smushed that one is. Oh, wow. Huh. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'm missing the front wheels. That one oh. smashed. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. These things are only worth what somebody's willing to pay for them. It's not like a yeah. rare postage stamp. I'm a member of several collectors Facebook groups, and it seems not a day goes by somebody does uh, post something. They're like, "Oh, it's an error. What's it worth?" And it's like, Mike Zarnock put it very well. He's like, "It's broken. It's not worth anything." <laughs> but uh, but there are some people that in- enjoy factory errors. I-, I think those are probably people that come from the currency world or coin collectors, and they think, "Oh, well, because I- I- I've got a friend who's a coin collector, and getting a." A coin error is incredibly rare and very valuable because the quality control on something like currency is much, much higher than it would be for toy cars. You're so, right. yeah. Well, very fun. Okay. This is the super fast haul. Why? This is where some people lose it because it's. Yeah. Look at that. This goes on. Wow. Yeah. Take a, take what your I time walking down wrong- that hole. 98% of what's in this area basically was a dollar car somewhere along the line. Sure. And it's all in numerical order. It's actually where it was set up years ago. Number one didn't start as far as it does now. Actually, number one starts all the way in the other room wow. and comes back around and then back in the other room again. Yeah, and I'm running out of space in here again. If you see any gaps, that's to give myself some space for any mm-hmm. existing model that may still mm-hmm. be running. Yeah. In the, um, collection. Mm-hmm. You think there's any out there, Charlie, that you don't know about? Any what? Any, any models out there that you haven't seen or hadn't heard about? Uh, every once in a while, something shows up on eBay. It's like, what? Where did that one come from? Because there's been a couple like really rare promos that they've been like hidden in the woodwork. Right. And, uh, there's only a few around. It's like, where are they hiding these things? Hold on. They even did preschool toys. Yeah. And that. Yeah, what call in pack and on pack offers, where you'd either mail in for your stuff or stuff like those, where mm-hmm. you actually get the product with the model. Right. Yeah. Like I, I, I remember saving Rice Krispie uh, proof of purchases to get the Model A van. Oh uh, yes, from a cereal box. That's when they had a bump then make an extra casting they made made so many of those i think they made like seven million of them wow really was that gold car uh i don't know if it was a contest or what i mean was that a was that a big hit for Max challenge Marks? winner car yeah uh i mean did that i have one but i never got to win one i had to pay secondary market did that achieve to, what they wanted it to do? Was that a big hit uh, for collectors? Well, when Tyco did the challenge cars, they were, it said on their collect all 75. Mm-hmm. And at one point, they weren't going to make all 75. And somebody threatened to sue them. And so oh, wow. they finished them. In the last 10 or 12, they uh, solid packed for... Toys R Us and KB mm-hmm. and put them out that way so that the set was finished. But they did screw the set up because the 55 players I'd pick up in the 70 Pontiac and then a, some of the 
53 rhino rods they had ripped all out of the packaging because it was their intention not to finish. And then they stuck them in 10 packs. So there are no two of those models. There's no existing packaging for them. Interesting. So enterprising collectors made their own blister cards and <laughs> mm-hmm. many years ago made some uh, boxes Nature up. Nature found a way. Something. So what was the ultimate prize car at the end of the challenge? It was actually boxed differently. And it was a number four, uh, 57 Chevy. Hmm. Yeah, that's right. The Bel Air. The, yes. Yeah. Okay. Charlie, have you ever run across somebody with a collection as comprehensive as this one? That's as big as this one? Well, just I'm comprehensive, meaning start to finish. Ex- so many There's examples. Like two other people that delve in this deep. Yeah. You got Everett Marshall with the Matchbox mm-hmm. Road Museum. Yep. Down in New Jersey. That's right. The one thing he doesn't do is uh, he doesn't delve as deep into the non die cast as I, I do. Mm-hmm. Like the dolls and the plastic kits and stuff. So he's heavy, heavier on die cast. And then you got Jim Glegoats out in New Mexico. And he's into everything. He's got Matchbox, Hot Wheels, Corgi, Lido, Dinky. You name mm-hmm. the brand, the man has it. And he says he has 220,000 vehicles. <laughs> wow. Here's the one that we were just discussing. There Charles it is. Winner, sir. Look at that. That's the letter that came with it. I had to have a letter uh, reprinted because when they sent it to you, it was folded up into about 20, 20, <laughs> 20 uh, right. sizes smaller. Mm-hmm. So do you still have some contacts? Within the the company, have what? Do you have any contacts within with with Mattel or with Matchbox folks that you still interact um, with? And- I don't know if they know I exist. To tell you the truth, hmm. I lost my contacts. I'm going to walk up the stairs when uh, the company left the East Coast in 2004. Hmm. Well, so that's I'm, their their loss. We had another guest on our show, uh, Giles Chapman, and he wrote a book called Britain's Toy Car Wars about the, it was, what was it, Dinky versus Lesney versus uh, Corgi uh, in the mm-hmm. 60s and 70s. And uh, it's just kind of fascinating because over here, we really only had Matchbox and Hot Wheels as really the the brands like you might find majorettes somewhere but mm-hmm. over there it was almost like uh a, a rivalry on the level of uh like football teams over there yeah. like the, right. the arsenal versus manchester liverpool. united kind of stuff or li- because it was like one was made in liverpool one was made in london and there were these uh this intense competition that a lot of people don't think about when they when they think about Matchbox, right? So I don't know if you've had a chance to check out his book, but it is a it is a really interesting read. Uh, so, Charlie, I, I'm curious is is a collection evolving even today? Are you, are you looking at the stuff they do now and giving it your thumbs up and collecting it? Like some of their I collect, I premium stuff right up to present. Okay. okay. So, uh, how do you feel about some of their really higher cost premium boxed models that they're putting out now? Everything seems to be good quality right now. They had a little bit of a 
maybe in the last 10 years where they started to make a couple models in, out of plastic. Yeah. Instead of all die cast. Mm -hmm. And in the last, I think it's the last three years, all the new models they're doing are all licensed where they yeah. were slowly getting rid of the generics as new mm -hmm. castings. They yeah. actually did uh, maybe three would come out out of 25 where at one point it was almost like half and half. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You I'm know, thinking, but, I'm trying to think They still out. make their money off of some of the generics by throwing them in the five packs on us or yeah. the 10 pack or something. Yeah. I was going to say, I think really the, the last one I can think of that was kind of generic was the push and puller. Right. It's the last one that that's I can think I of think, in recent uh, about three years. This, that's, I'm yeah, it's, third that's year. been around for a little hoping bit. Hoping yeah. that it doesn't come out again. Because that <laughs> blue one was a real bad uh, peg warmer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was like that one and that auto drive uh, little mini bus thing and the, the cargo carrier for the uh, the airport cargo carrier. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. had like this. Yeah, that guy. Well, it's, it's not dead yet because they just put it as uh, this is the new... Uh, gift pack exclusive so they yeah. are going to get their get their uh life oh, out of it somehow yeah and man, welcome uh, back to the morris minor too yeah yeah that one's got already uh three variations this year it's got a maroon one yeah. in the nine pack mm -hmm. the uh, blue one in the five, five pack mm -hmm. and there's a single version and then you yeah. can get it with left and right hand drive double your variations i didn't did oh, yeah. that. Like the kind of like that uh, MR2 so that they did the where the, with the headlights up, headlights down, left and right. Yep. Oh, that one's driving us crazy, especially yeah. the opening part <laughs> one because you can't find a lot of those. So you have up and down, left and right. And then yep. they did a collector's version. Try to find that one. Yeah. Charlie, I, th I think we need to have you on another episode and just have viewers call in and try and stump you because i i got my money on you okay yeah i don't think anybody could uh could out trivia you on uh, uh i'm amazed I you, you got, I gotta, well, there's a couple things like you can out there's like a german guy that can out trivia me on regular wheels with little nitpicky yeah. variations and stuff i usually have most of my numbers down and memorized yeah that's crazy that's cool. I, I actually, it's funny. I, I'm thinking I need to send you a link to a video I just did. A, a friend of mine is an antiques dealer, and he keep across a bunch of inbox Moco Lesneys and uh, let me document them. I I have no idea. <laughs> like I just kind of showed them off and was like, "Hey, maybe somebody watching this will know." <laughs> but uh, you you might. I don't think there's anything in there that was too earth shattering. Nothing I couldn't find on eBay. What was that uh, soapbox but, one you had, Chuck? Oh, yeah, yeah, I threw that one away. <laughs> yeah, didn't, didn't have a box. <laughs> yeah, no box. You know, what's interesting, too, is the uh, fact that I, could, I keep getting uh, consignment collections, and yet with all these models I have, I'll still find something I don't have. Yeah. You know, these are the, the sets that I really like. These play sets are really cool. You this know, item is kind of interesting one. historically. The mm -hmm. la laser gun? Yeah, the Space Outlaw gun. Yeah. The only part of that that Lesney Products made is on the inside of the gun. It's a piece of metal for a tri uh, trigger mechanism inside. Huh. It's the only piece they made. Everything else is plastic. And sure. Lesney didn't uh, do anything with that because they didn't uh, do anything with plastic oh yeah they were a refiner they were right? all die cast yeah but they needed this this company didn't make metal so they needed something for the hmm. the gun to make uh it's flashing oh. thing so that's the only purpose so, of having that in the collection and you can't see so the part they made get one of those and a pair of windshield wipers from venezuela and you're set yeah yeah <laughs> this one here is my favorite regular wheel Boxall Krista. Very nice. You got 14 of them. Wow. 
they're still missing a couple. Uh, but you mentioned the rare box earlier. That's mm -hmm. uh, that was a copy. I can't afford the two thousand dollars they want to the box. Sure. The one yeah. with these twenty two in the square in the corner. Charlie, what uh, what what era had the uh, wheels that had eight dots on them? The super fast ones. Is that what that is? Uh, it's, they, it's a chrome. They actually call it the eight dot. Eight dot. Wheel. Okay. Those would have been after Lesney. They would have been eighty three to eighty six somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. Wow! Incredible. Yeah, uh, and you're up in New England, right? Right. Connecticut. 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 Right. <laughs> Smack dab in the middle of the state in a little town called Durham. All right. Every now and then I find myself in Boston. I might have to swing by sometime next time I'm around. Yeah, Boston, I think, is a couple hours. Yeah. Well, it'd be worth the drive. That's incredible. So what's uh, what's next for... The collection and, or maybe the museum, Charlie, any big, I don't know, news oh, that's going to break I'll in 24? Uh, I can't think of anything. I, I've been holding back a little bit, trying to find a couple things that there's a 2017 Toy Fair mm -hmm. model. It's a Mercedes six by six, but the uh, eBayers want. Three to five hundred dollars for it. That's not in the budget. Mm -hmm. There was yeah. a 2020 one, 2021 Toy Fair model. And they didn't make very many. It was a Honda E. That one, I've only seen one on eBay and it went mm -hmm. like in the hundreds. Yeah. And even the one for this year for 2024, it's an Audi e tron. You wouldn't think anybody would want an Audi e tron, but apparently at two hundred dollars, that's but they were for on e trial. Then you got uh, Matchbox is doing chase vehicles. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, the super chase. And those are getting annoying. They did uh, four of them last year in their opening uh, moving part series. Mm -hmm. And they numbered them 51 through 54. I'm still looking for 51, 52, 53 because they range from. Fifty to eighty dollars, up to two hundred dollars a piece. Mm -hmm. so apparently, yeah. they didn't make very many of them. So, is eBay the best place to find cars like this, or are there other ways that you recommend people go to to find Matchbox? Depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking for the rare and unusual, eBay is your place, unless you know anybody else that has them. Uh, some of the guys have been uh, dabbling in on Facebook, selling their stuff yeah. now, trying to, I guess, avoid paying eBay or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Too much to manage if you're like trying to yeah. sell something and put it on five different sites. Sure. And then uh, try to uh, figure out who messaged you first to get the first dibs on the model you're selling. Mm -hmm. So I stick with eBay when I sell anything. Nice. Charlie, do you want to, and we can cut this part out if you don't, but do you want to throw out your eBay store name for people? Sure. It's under M-T-C-H-B-O-X-U-S-A. Okay. I'm also under Facebook, under Charlie Mac. And I also list there when I do my uh, eBay, I post on certain days and times. And when I do, I post it on my Facebook page when the first auction of that day breaks. So people can link in through Facebook to see the auctions as well. Awesome. Well, very cool. Well, Charlie, uh, thank you so much for taking us on a walking tour of this. this it's an incredible kind of gave you a like collection. a haphazard tour because I jumped around a little bit. Oh, that's okay. I, I mean, you really, 
feels like something you really have to be there to. There's some stuff you still didn't see because I didn't show you. Okay. All wrong. All the case. I don't think think I missed this one. Oh well. Let's see. Game Boy. (laughs) That's what I saw too. Yeah. Well, I guess there. You can see there's all kinds of weird stuff. Yeah. Well, I guess there was, was. Was there a Game Boy Matchbox game? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I saw the Game Boy in there. Yeah, the Pyramids was. of Ra. Why they would do that, I don't know. That's weird. I believe. Okay. Yeah. There was one other one that they did that I had it in here. But it was, it was weird that they would market that as a matchbox game. Oh, here's huh. the other one. Air Sea and Air Sea Rescue. Cool. Okay. Got phones and all kinds of stuff. Let's remind people of uh, where they can find out more about your museum and where they can find you on the internet. Okay. Well, my only internet connection is through Facebook or eBay. Okay. So I do have right. a website. All right. So well, either we'll, of those. We will direct people to the Facebook and eBay. So that's Charlie Mack on Facebook. Well, the phone uh, number is good if they want to phone me. Okay, sure. Okay. We can give out the phone number. 860-349-1655. All righty. Make sure that's listed in the show notes as well, because uh, it's it absolutely looks like it would be worth a day trip out to to look around and, and hang out with just so much history. That's incredible. Right. It's all by appointment. So I usually yeah. steer you people away from Mondays or Tuesdays in the after, early afternoon, because that's my eBay time. Gotcha. Most of the other days are fine. Weekends are fine. Okay. Well, cool. Well, we will uh, make sure we get the word out about that. And we'll link to that uh, documentary as well, because that was a really cool uh, documentary. I do have one more thing I wanted to show you from my collection that I think is kind of fun. So I don't know if you can see this or not, but <laughs> it's... Uh, uh, I was showing David this the other day. It's an X-ray of a Matchbox Porsche 935. Oh wow! And uh, so, yeah, I don't know too many people. Who What's the purpose them. of the X-ray? So, when I was in kindergarten, uh, I was uh, the the school bully dislocated my finger and, okay. on the playground, and so they took me to the the hospital. And my parents, uh, their kid was hurt, so they gave me a Matchbox car. And it was the okay. white Porsche 935 with the red, orange, and yellow stripes on it. I think it had a number 10 on it or something. Can't remember. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, so that that car was uh, a brand new matchbox for me. And I'm in the hospital and they x-rayed my finger. And as they were finishing, I asked the technician if they would x-ray my car. And they said, sure. So, uh, so I've got a, an official medical grade x-ray of a Porsche 935 that I've had okay, for, well, you're the only person that yeah. has a matchbox x-ray. That, they that, that we're in the museum. They yeah. Something in the, museum. the museum doesn't have. <laughs> yes. That's my, that's my little bit of, of, of matchbox memorabilia that, uh, that is very special to me. I also have, uh, on my snap on tool chest out in the garage, I've got a bumper sticker. This is my other car is a matchbox. But uh, it's on one of the drawers. It's a very fun bumper sticker, probably from the 80s. Yeah, I've got one on yeah. my car, and I've got one on the head of my bed. <laughs> nice. So, all right. Well, Charlie, it, it's been an absolute delight to talk to you. I'm definitely going to find a copy of your book somewhere, because that just sounds like a really cool book to have. But mm-hmm. uh, again, we, we really appreciate having you on. It's been a lot of fun, and uh, I hope people... Uh, take you up on your offer and set up an appointment to to see the museum because it's absolutely worth uh coming out there so again thank oh, you so much for get one last picture of this sure got on of me sure right. uh i can, I, I'm, can see just you and your hand there we go just, just give me another matchbox and no one gets hurt <laughs> i love it 
Yeah. Friend no. got me that for a uh, birthday present. <laughs> That's very fun. And it's one of the kind, so I told my I'm not wearing it. <laughs> I, I got to well, keep it mint. Yeah, sometimes those uh, those customs are are some of the most special. So, well, very cool. Well, again, Charlie, thank you so much for being here. It's it's been a delight. We'll absolutely have to have you on and and talk more about Dyke uh, Matchbox specifically because uh, there's a a lot of history there, a lot more than just about any other. Uh, well literally more than any other diecast toy company because they were uh they were the original so uh yeah so there's a a vast world out there and i know a lot of people tend to overlook matchbox and i think that's a mistake on their part there's a lot of beautiful designs out there Uh, Mm -hmm. i think they're i i agree with you there's a lot of great stuff coming out now i love the 1980 amc eagle that they came out with i think you pointed Mm -hmm. out the 41 cadillac that's another one that's very pretty um they're they're doing a lot of really great stuff and the the technology and the uh the availability of these cars and there's i would almost say never been a better time to be a diecast collector i would say that too you would and have quite frequently (laughs) that's going to be on uh david's tombstone charlie thank you so much for being here and thank you viewers listeners wherever you are if you're listening watching for making it to the end of another episode of Diecast Breakdown. Again, a shout out to our patrons who make this show go. If you want to join their ranks, you can visit diecastbreakdown.com or click the little join button. And while you're looking down there, make sure you like, subscribe, and of course, share these episodes. That's the best way to help spread the word about this channel, help it grow. Click around, visit some of the other videos. We got a whole lot more than just the Diecast podcast here. We've got builds, we've got collections, we've got news, all kinds of great stuff. But Stick around because we got a lot more great stuff. All things diecast coming your way. So as always, we want to thank you for coming along with us for the ride. So until next time, stay fresh, cheese bags. Thanks for listening to Diecast Breakdown. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts and tell a friend to listen in. Find Diecast Breakdown on your favorite social media platforms or visit diecastmedianetwork.com to learn more about this and our other projects. Diecast Breakdown is a presentation of Flying Valiant and the Diecast Media Network.